Well, we all know about the advances in AI, and we've heard the scenarios about how it'll affect education. But what about the AI-generated text detection tools? What's out there? Are they any good? Will they tell us if our students are cheating? Also, on the topic of artificial intelligence, OpenAI has announced that there are now free and paid plans for ChatGPT. I'll break down the differences today. In non-AI news, Google Slides has an awesome new follow feature that'll kick your collaboration up a notch. And Flip has implemented a bunch of the updates that they announced back in the summer. Welcome into episode 17 of the EdTech News Brief. I'm your host, Jake Miller. This is the show where, as the title says, I tell you about the EdTech News and I keep it brief. This is episode 17. It's February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day. And I've got some EdTech News to share with you today. On February 10th, OpenAI announced that there are now two different ChatGPT plans, a free plan and a $20 a month ChatGPT Plus plan. For those of you bummed to lose full access, look on the bright side. I really expected them to take away the free plan entirely. So how are the two plans different? Well, the free one will only be available when demand is low, while the plus plan will always be available. The free one will have the standard response speed, while the plus plan will have a faster response speed. Finally, the free plan will receive regular model updates, while the plus plan will get you priority access to new features. For those of you interested in those $20 a month paid plans, it looks like they're gradually releasing access to them, so you may have to join a wait list before you can get it. A few minor chat GPT updates. They've made a few updates to the model since it first launched, and recently they added the ability to stop generating a response. This is nice when chat GPT is giving you a long-winded answer that you don't need. As you're certainly aware, many educators are concerned about students using OpenAI's artificial intelligence conversational chatbot, ChatGPT, for plagiarism or to cheat on their work. While there's evidence that this is happening, there's also evidence that it's not as urgent as many make it seem. You have to be 18 or older to legally use ChatGPT, and students will likely be on the free plan, meaning they'll only be able to access the bot when demand is low. But that hasn't stopped tools geared toward detecting the use of ChatGPT and other AI tools from popping up. Let's discuss a few of them. The first AI detection tool on the scene was probably GPT-0, which was launched by a 22-year-old Princeton senior, Edward Chian, on January 2nd. Ironically, he created GPT-0 using a tool, GitHub Copilot, that is powered by GPT-3, the same powerful machine learning model that powers ChatGPT itself. The free tool crashed due to demand within days before his hosting service gave him extra resources to keep it running. So it's up and running now thanks to that. What it does is look at the complexity of the text and the variation of the sentences to determine how likely it is that the text you put into it was AI generated. Let me repeat an important phrase there, how likely it is, not if, but how likely. You could use this to see if it may have been written by AI, but it can't guarantee it. And it actually doesn't tell you one way or another. Instead, it gives you a burstiness score and a perplexity score, two measures that Tian created, and then uses both to tell you how likely it is that the portion of text that you used was an AI-generated sample. And as you could probably guess after hearing that, it's not foolproof or 100% accurate. I actually tested it on an excerpt from my book and on a silly story that I had ChatGPT write. It said that both had some parts that may have been written by AI when in actuality, one was written completely by AI and one was written completely by me. A few weeks after GPT-0 came out, the company behind ChatGPT themselves, OpenAI, released their own tool meant to detect AI-generated text. In the press release announcing this free tool, which is called AI Text Classifier, OpenAI said that it is not fully reliable and should not be used as a primary decision-making tool. There are a few additional disclaimers on the site telling you that it requires a minimum of 1,000 characters, that's three and a half tweets worth of text, that you can easily edit AI-generated text and trick this tool, that it struggles with children's writing, and that it has a difficulty with non-English text. So I tried it with a silly story that I had ChatGPT write, and it said that it was unclear if it was computer generated. It did identify an excerpt of my book as being very unlikely AI generated. 
product. And let's think about that. The company that made ChatGPT can't make a tool that, that detects AI text 100% accurately. Another AI detection tool is fictitious.ai. It offers a freemium model. In the free version, you can integrate fictitious.ai into the Canvas LMS, but you have to schedule a consultation to get started. The paid versions add in additional LMSs and a few other features. Their site proclaims that their machine learning model can detect generated content with 99.9% .9 accuracy. That's much higher than any other tool says, but I haven't tested it out. The screenshots on the site indicate that it measures the integrity of each submission on a percentage scale, with higher numbers indicating a higher likelihood of AI-generated text. It also breaks this down on the sentence, paragraph, and essay level. So it'll tell you how likely it is the whole essay was generated by AI, as well as each individual sentence. I should point out one of the human written paragraphs in their example on the site showed up as 20.3% AI generated, meaning that even their tool thought that there was a one fifth chance that something that they had written was written by AI. So again, not 100% accurate and not foolproof. And also that 99% accuracy, I don't think it means it's saying 99% of the time we say, yes, this is AI written. They're saying 99.9% .9 of the time we identify it as maybe 75 or, or more likely, and it is AI generated. Quill.org and Common Lit teamed up to provide the free AI writing check service at AIWritingCheck.org. They report that based on testing with 15,000 essays, their tool is accurate 80 to 90% of the time. So use it on 100 students' essays and be prepared to be wrong on 10 to 20 of them. For example, I plugged in a silly story written by ChatGPT and it predicted that it had been written by a human. I plugged in an excerpt from my own book and it again said that it was written by a human. So one for two. By the way, these two nonprofits, Quill and Common Lit, that brought us this tool also developed a four page PDF toolkit about addressing AI plagiarism in the classroom. It's definitely worth checking out. Finally, writer.com offers an AI content detector, which is actually geared towards making sure web pages don't have or appear to have too much AI generated content, as I guess some search engines are less likely to show those results if they believe they were AI generated. However, we could use it for this, looking at student writing as well. Like the other tools we've discussed, this free tool shows a percentage of how likely it is that their text was AI or human generated. With this one, the higher percent in indicates a higher likelihood that a human wrote it. So you're hoping for 100%. I tried it on a silly story generated by ChatGPT and it said it was 100% human generated. Oops. It also read an excerpt from my book as 100% human generated, which it is because I'm a human. But I forget, is 50% accuracy a passing score? No? Yeah, I didn't think so. So good news and bad news. The good news, there are tools that detect AI generated text. The bad news, none of them, not even the one that OpenAI themselves made, are 100% accurate. And you can't downplay that. If you falsely accuse a student of cheating on an assignment, whether by looking at a peer's paper, copying text from Wikipedia, or by using AI, you are destroying that trust, that rapport, and that respect that you have with that student. This cannot be taken lightly. So my advice would be to only use these tools when you suspect AI was used. And that means knowing your student's typical writing style, their typical quality, their typical patterns, and being able to notice departures from those. When you look at a paper that looks different from the last five you've read, then you should say, hmm, what's going on here? And then sure, if that happens, maybe you consider one of these tools. But remember, you still won't be sure. So tread very carefully with these. A shout out, by the way, to Matt Miller and Carly Mora at Ditch That Textbook. I knew a few of these AI detection tools by staying plugged into EdTech News, but the rest I found through their awesome AI and education page on the Ditch That Textbook site. So as you can tell, AI is a hot topic in education right now, and I'm going to put in one AI piece 
per episode from here on out. So if you're watching on YouTube, click that thumbs up to tell me thanks, but more importantly, click subscribe and ring that notifications bell. And if you're listening to the podcast, don't forget to follow the show or subscribe if that's what your app says so that you don't miss those up AI updates and other ed tech updates. And if you have a moment, please submit a review. What computer number does Billy have? Why doesn't our spreadsheet list a computer for Veronica? Does your school district have a one-to-one -one technology program and you're struggling to manage the district's IT assets in a spreadsheet? If you're tasked with managing thousands of Chromebooks or other IT assets like projectors and smart boards, you'll want to check out today's sponsor, Visor. Visor is a Chromebook and IT asset management solution designed specifically for school districts. Visor, that's V-I-Z-O-R, seamlessly integrates with the Google Admin Console and your student information system and will reduce the amount of Advil you need from looking at that spreadsheet. <laughs> with Visor, you can easily see which student has which device, manage repairs, and streamline device checkout with barcodes. To find out more and get up to 20% off, go to visor.com dot cloud slash Jake. That's V I Z O R dot cloud slash Jake, or just click the link in the show notes or the video description. I think we should change this slide's background to be white. Wait, what slide are you on? Slide 17. Oh, okay. Let me jump to that slide. Okay. Then on this slide, I think we should change it to bullet points. Which slide? Slide 20. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> We've all done this before, right? Anyone who has ever collaborated on Google Slides has said, what slide are you on? Like a billion times. You've long been able to jump to the slide a collaborator is on by clicking on their icon by the share button, and then it jumps to that slide. But now you could do even better. Google Slides has added a follow option. Now you click on a collaborator, and then as they move through slides, you'll follow right along with them. They're selling this as a way to collaborate with someone, which it is great for, and I agree, and I will use it for that. But I think this has some superpowers for the classroom as well. If you've ever used Pear Deck or Nearpod, you know how nice it is to be able to guide your students through a slideshow with you. You move to slide six, and they automatically come to slide six with you. But what if you don't use Pear Deck or Nearpod? Well, with this feature, you can mimic that experience. If all of your students click on your icon and then follow you, they'll advance through the slides with you. If you try it out, I'd love to hear what you think of this experience. This Google Slides feature is available on all Google accounts. Back in the summer, I shared about a set of updates that Flip, then called Flipgrid, announced at their FlipFest event at ISTE 2022. Recently, many of those updates that they announced went into effect. Let's talk about some of them. First, on your computer, there's now a unified view for all users, meaning whether you're a teacher, known as a lead on Flip, or a student, known as a member on Flip, you'll have the same simple view. The views are slightly customized based on your role, lead or member, but they're essentially the same, meaning you'll always know what the student view looks like on Flip. Speaking of the view, you'll notice that it's totally different from what it was a year ago. Your groups and topics are all on the left side of the screen, and the videos and content within your groups and topics take up the 80% or so of the screen to the right of that. This means you can easily jump from group to group and topic to topic without lots of clicking. You can also minimize that left menu so that it takes up an even smaller portion of the screen. There are also a lot of other visual changes, including the style, the branding, the ability to toggle between light and dark modes, and an improved view of all the topics within a group. The playback experience in Flip also looks different and features a bigger video view and vertical buttons for moving between videos, which will make it super smooth to watch a set of videos. This also works within the mobile app, at least on my iOS. The members view has also improved, adding in the ability to easily see a member's videos within a group and even block members if needed. In line with all of the updates to the appearance of Flip, they've also improved the camera view on both mobile and desktop. I find that the features are easier to find in this new format. You can also find new video backgrounds that you could use. A few years ago, they added the backdrop option, but now there are backdrops that have moving effects, which is really cool. Also, you'll see a create mode, which takes away the webcam and lets you or your learners focus on adding content like images, GIFs, text, drawings onto the screen. 
It also has a timer option for if you're doing something like a stop motion animation, you can record in one, three, or five second increments. So you select the increment, and then when you click the button to record, it'll record for just that amount of time and then stop so that you could change what's on the screen and record the next portion of your animation or tutorial or whatever it might be. Their product features blog points out that this create mode could be a great way to create title cards and transitions that go between video segments within your flip video. A big update to Flip is that all users, leads, and members can now edit the automated captions for their own videos. Leads can also edit those captions for their members' videos. Now, this has been the case for a while. A teacher could modify the captions for a student video, but now students can modify their own as well. And I love how you could see the video and the caption side by side while editing them. Previously, the caption editing area was below the video. This whole caption update is really nice because the automated captions are quite accurate to begin with, and you could now just go in and fix any errors within those captions. Years ago, I would have told you that this is great for UDL and accessibility, which it is. I still agree with that. But now we know that most videos that are watched nowadays, think TikTok, Instagram Reels, they're watched with the sound off. So having accurate captions is important, and now you can do so in Flip as well. Next, you can also now customize group links and group codes, meaning it's now easier to brand and share your links with your class, community, or group. Also, you can now archive old groups, which clears up your viewing experience, but also means that your group members can no longer access the group either. They should, however, still be able to access their videos from that group from within their My Videos tab. By the way, that My Videos tab is a newer feature as well. We used to need to navigate to a different URL to see all of our flip videos, but now members and leads can all access any of their own videos in this easy to locate spot. There are still a few things we're waiting on from the updates that they announced back in June. I'm betting we'll be talking about Flip again in a few months. Today's episode is also sponsored by Screencastify. Want to begin recording, editing, and creating video assignments for your students in seconds? Today's sponsor, Screencastify, is 100% focused on creating the best video creation tools to help K-12 educators get the absolute best learning outcomes from every student no matter the classroom environment. Screencastify is free to use and can be installed from the Chrome store and ready to record your first video in seconds. And with tools built specifically for educators, you'll be able to polish videos and add interactive questions to improve engagement and use viewer analytics to measure student comprehension in real time. You can even create video assignments to bring out the inner creators in each of your students. Start your journey to creating better videos for your classroom now by clicking the link in the show notes or video description. Hey, as we look forward to springtime and summertime, it's school leaders' chance to start thinking about professional development days and book studies and stuff like that. If you're looking for someone to help your staff set their educational technology integration mindset, or heck, to talk about AI and education, let me know. I'd love to be a part of your PD day. And if you're up for a book study, I think that the Educational Duct Tape book makes a great book study book. A quick shout out to the winners of our recent book creator contest. They are at Jolie G1, at Lori Schroeder 2, and at Angela Plank 2. And there's a pattern with the numbers in their names. Let's look at that with that. Finally, the way I cap off every episode is with a dad joke straight from the world's greatest dad jokes, the complete collection, over 500 cringeworthy puns and one-liners book. Let's see which one we get here. Why don't vampires visit casinos? The stakes are too high. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you tuning in. I know your time is valuable. I know the stakes are high, so I appreciate you tuning in. I hope that despite the high stakes and the high demands for your time as an educator, that you'll be back again in the next week or two when I return my next episode. And I'd really appreciate it if you do those awesome things like rating or reviewing the show on Apple Podcasts liking or subscribing to the show on YouTube, following the podcast in your favorite app, and of course, sharing this episode. Have a great day, everybody.